About the only thing that marred the before-the-show activities here at Channel 13 was the appearance of a picket from La Raza Unida. La Raza had threatened to picket the show because they said the La Raza candidate for governor was not invited by Channel 13. One picket showed up about 20 minutes before airtime and posed obligingly for TV cameramen. The lights attracted two or three more singly and in pairs. Meanwhile, the Republican candidates for governor, who were the first ones to go on the air tonight, went into the studio and began the show. Frank's Phone Company is out of service, and Southwestern Bell, who advertises being the only phone company in town, would like to keep it that way. With the help of the FBI, they managed to shut down 19-year-old W.H. Savage III, alias Frank of Dallas. Frank, with the help of a blue box and a black box and the trunk lines of Ma Bell, managed to form his own long-distance phone service, with which he could call any place in the world for free. The phone company is understandably reluctant to tell the world exactly how this trick is uh, performed, but the security manager for the company, Jim Vaughn, did tell us a little bit about the boxes. Well, Judy, the blue box first got its name simply because it was found in a blue box. It has nothing to do with its operation. It is a device that is composed of electronic circuitry designed to bypass our billing equipment when used on the originating end of a long-distance call. Can you tell us a little bit more how it works? Well, there are two types, generally. The most common type is one that is used uh, acoustically. That would be that uh, blue boxes today are capable of being in a, a old size of a package of cigarettes or smaller, and you would merely take the box, if it were about this size, and place it over the mouthpiece of the telephone and omit certain tones that would go around our billing equipment and complete your call free of charge. People who use these magic boxes are called phone freaks. One of the very first blue boxes in existence was built and used in Dallas. The phone company, somewhat sensitive about the $34 million a year they lose through toll fraud, caught that freak too. For Channel 8 News on the Move, this is Judy Hanna at Bell Telephone. Back in December, a group of citizens known as the Zoo Action Group persuaded the Fort Worth Council to delay the admission fee at the zoo for at least three months. That time would allow them to raise $100,000 in cash for needed repairs at Forest Park Zoo. And the council hinted that if the money was raised, the admission fee would not be initiated for at least a year. However, the council contends that the Zoo Action Group did not raise the money. The Zoo Action Group says they did. The differences of opinion arose over in-kind services. The Zoo Action Group did raise about $15,000 in cash, but about $140,000 was raised in in-kind services for paving of the zoo parking lot. The city council says that in-kind services cannot be counted toward the $100,000 goal. The Zoo Action Group did show a great deal of strength in organizing and enthusiasm for a good cause. On that, even the city council and the park board agrees. But now the machinery is rolling. The hardware has been ordered for turnstiles to be placed right here beginning May 1st, next Monday. And a ticket office will also be installed the work is to begin tomorrow. City officials still believe that the gate fee will not hurt the overall attendance at the zoo and will also uh, raise the needed revenue to continue repairs and improvements at Forest Park Zoo. At any rate, for those who do not feel that they can pay the $1 admission fee for those 12 years old and older, will probably pack into Forest Park Zoo this weekend, the last days of free admission at the zoo. Jim Green, Channel 8 News on the Move in Fort Worth.
The Republican problems this year revolve around money and voting machines, surprisingly too much of both. For the first time since 1964, the GOP will have voting machines for use in a primary election. There are almost 200 of the machines for use in the 306 precincts in Dallas County. County Chairman Bob Porter says he'll put the machines where he expects the heaviest voting turnout and the most action. As far as the money is concerned, a pleasant surprise for Porter is that he can now pay poll workers. Traditionally, Republican poll workers have been unpaid volunteers. But of course, in the latest special session, when the state assumed the responsibility of primary financing, they also supplied money for poll workers. How is this going to affect the primary election in the Republican Party? That's what I asked County Chairman Porter and Jim Jackson, who will run tonight's school for Republican poll workers. Uh, will be that we can tabulate our vote much quicker, get it in and have the results in each race much quicker because uh, if we were on paper ballots, we'd probably have some long lines uh, which would slow down uh, getting the final results and slow down counting the vote. How about the, the paid workers for the first time this year? What effect will that have? I think it uh, won't have any effect one way or the other. Uh, uh, we've always had volunteers before, but we've had uh, very capable people. Is the split between paper ballots and voting machines going to, going to give you any trouble? Yes, it is. Uh, most of the problem, however, is already has already occurred in preparing for an election by splitting between paper ballots and voting machines. You're actually preparing for two separate elections. Tonight, Republican poll workers are beginning a series of meetings with Jim Jackson to carefully go over the procedures of how they're going to run the primary election using the unaccustomed voting machines. The GOP is hoping for a large turnout during the Republican primary, and if that happens, it could have an effect on Texas politics for the next several years. This is Phil Reynolds, Channel 8 News on the Move. You know, the separation of the people is, as time goes on, much more aggravating than the division of the country. And as long as we can't overcome the separation of the people, we have to do all we can to uh, make the consequences of the separation uh, more bearable and less 
aggravating. Jesus said, Wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Well, the city of Dallas says, if those two or three want to gather together regularly, the place of worship had better meet zoning standards. To the tiny Mennonite church of Dallas, that city law represents a threat to its freedom of worship. Two Mennonite families meet each Sunday in the back room of the pastor's home on Hollis Street. But the head of city building inspection, Tom Jones, has told the Reverend Richard St. Clair that it's unlawful to hold church services in his private home without building a church parking lot. In other words, you can have a church and a home in the same building. A church, of course, is a specific use in itself as opposed to a residence. And as such, will be required to comply to certain requirements separate than those that would be applicable to a residence. The city has suspended legal action to give the Mennonites time to comply with the zoning requirements. The parking lot is in the preacher's backyard, and the Reverend St. Clair says he can't afford to spend the $1,000. We feel like if we have to go into hiding to worship God, then it will be the same as it was after 1536 and between then in 1795, when we were allowed only to meet in barns and disguised houses, we must have the freedom to worship openly, no matter if our size is smaller than other congregations, or because we don't have the funds to build the structures that the city of Dallas requires that a church have. And so our congregation is small, just being a couple families, and so we feel that we have this right to worship a couple families in our home. Larger, wealthier churches can obey the law by providing parking lots for their huge congregations. But the smaller Mennonite church can't afford parking and doesn't need it, and claims that city zoning laws threaten its freedom of worship. On the other hand, the city says, what would prevent the bigger churches from clogging the streets with its cars on Sunday morning if there were no zoning law at all? Martha McIntyre, Channel 8 News on the Move. We have put together here, uh, through the National Alliance of Businessmen, a Dallas Summer Youth Employment Program. And this is a coordinated uh, youth power delivery system that we're developing for the first time. It's a coordinated effort by a number of agencies here in the city of Dallas uh, to find jobs this summer, and uh, hopefully on a continuing basis uh, for some 5,000 uh, youngsters uh, in the Dallas area. Mr. Zeta, what type of jobs are you offering? Well, we're hopefully, uh, hopefully going to be able to uh, find meaningful positions uh, for them that will enable them uh, to develop their job skills into a, a career program. Uh, we're, as NAB has been doing with our veterans program and our disadvantaged programs, we're trying very hard uh, to find uh, positions for individuals that are, could be labeled as careers rather than just jobs. visits, of contacts, of telephone calls, of um, um, this is very much part of When last I visited the Bavarian capital city of Munich, the main attractions of the city were still the Glockenspiel and the tower of the old city hall, the Hofbrau House, where most of Munich's million and a half citizens and just about all of her visitors stop at one time or another to lift a flag in a veil, and the seven major breweries which produce 86 million gallons of German beer each year. 
In those days, the man in the street, the average citizen of Munich, was proud of the image of his city. He felt that it was one of beautiful alpine scenery and of congeniality. And he knew that in the hearts of every German, Munich was the secret capital of their country. The coming of the 20th Olympiad has cast an aura of doubt in the minds of many in Munich. At all costs, they feel, it must not be the exorbitant extravaganza remembered from 1936 when Hitler tried to outdo the world. All the visiting throngs with their tourist dollars will be very nice, believe the more conservative residents, but what of the time after they have gone? Munich is already in hock up to its spiraling rooftops, and a good guess puts the tab for the great games at 200-plus million marks, about $630 million. The cost of the awe-inspiring steel and plexiglass big top, or tent top, has doubled three times over already, going from an architect's estimate of $5 million to a tap on the taxpayers of over $40 million. Construction costs in general are averaging four times their anticipated costs. To the optimist, money is no real object. They figure to put in $50 million and get $400 million worth of beautiful schools, dormitories, and cultural facilities. Still, one can't help remembering sitting in a riverside cafe just a few short days ago, gazing absently up at a tower not dissimilar to this one, and listening to a disgruntled citizen say, that's just what San Antonio has always needed, acres of cultural opportunities you can't afford to attend because you're still paying for the buildings. Thinking back to Squaw Valley in Mexico City, one can only hope that this time it will be better. Jerry Taft, Channel 8 News on the move at the site of the 20th Olympiad in Munich. Letter to Travis Lynn, News Manager, WFAA-TV, Communication Center, Dallas. Dear Travis, just a note to say thank you for the news assignment of April 26, 1972. Your generosity in sending me out to cover Braniff International's tribute to the Secretary was just magnificent. Just for your information, today was National Secretary's Day as authorized proclamations issued by President Richard Nixon and Dallas Mayor Wes Wise. Some 200 secretaries of area corporations let me join them for breakfast aboard Braniff 747, just hours before it left on its daily run to Honolulu. The lovely ladies were served a champagne breakfast aboard the airplane, consisting of eggs benedict, fruit salad, Danish ham, and coffee. And oh yes, of course, champagne. It was done basically to honor the secretary on her day. Of all the assignments in the past 18 months, Trav, this has to be the greatest. And if you will, sign it. Sincerely yours, Jerry Park, Channel 8 News on the move at Love Field. Well, how'd I do, girls?